Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is the uh, first time I've been to this particular conference, and uh, I feel that it is uh, one of the best venues for uh, ME discussion uh, that I've encountered uh, over many years. Uh, I'd like to start with just one statement which is independent of my talk, and that is that uh, there's so much discussion, particularly over here, that, well, is it a psychiatric disease? Is it a real disease? The science is there. The question about whether or not ME is a real disease has been resolved scientifically long ago. Uh, there are at least 10 very good uh, physiologic tests which are abnormal in ME. Now, not everyone is an easy uh, patient marker, but it is a shame that this controversy goes on when, in fact, the science has already established that something is going on in ME, and it's not just a um, somatoform disorder. So I got that out of my system. I can move on now. Uh, I'd like to talk today about health identity confusion, which I see as a major problem in uh, the lives of people with ME. Uh, in 1985, there was a uh, outbreak in a small uh, rural area. This is uh, the area uh, of the outbreak. It's uh, the city of Rochester is on one side, city of Buffalo is to the other side. Right at the top of the slide is Lake Ontario with very good fish, and then right above that is Toronto. So this is a very small rural uh, area, and the total population in this area was about 25,000 at that time. Uh, being uh, probably the poorest county in New York State, the population has declined in the 25 years since then, so that there were not, not a single yuppie lives in this area. So I, I think that that's important to note. Uh, the reason this is important is I'd like to emphasize that uh, 210 people became ill over a uh, three-year period with what looked to be the same illness. Now, at the same time, there were many more people who had some type of uh, uh, flu-like illness which resolved before three months. Uh, so that this was not, not everyone went to at least six months. The people I'm talking about now all went to six months. We did publish uh, diagnostic criteria uh, for this group in 1988 at around the same time that the CDC criteria came out. Um, a few years later, we published a paper which was called the 13-year follow-up of children and adolescents with chronic fatigue syndrome. Forgive me for using that term, but um, uh, I've uh, been used to using that term in an attempt to be um, congenial with the U.S. Uh, uh, people, but that has never worked. They, they still don't like me very much. <laughs> um, 60 of the uh, 210 people were adolescents or children. Uh, and this particular um, uh, ratio is exactly the same ratio as found in other uh, community-wide outbreaks. And as you probably know, Gordon Parrish here in the UK published uh, a paper about uh, a number of years ago about 75 different uh, outbreaks of ME. And um, the first thing that told me that maybe this was ME that I was looking at was uh, seeing the ratio of children to adults with the illness. Now, this study, 13-year follow-up, uh, was um, badly misinterpreted, and I made some bad mistakes. Um, at 13 years of follow-up of these children, I, I studied just the children because... Um, um, they were going to outlive me, and uh, they were uh, easier to study. 80% um, of them were doing well. They considered themselves well. And this was based upon the questionnaires and uh, a number of uh, uh, interviews and uh, clinical follow-up. 
and 20% uh, had severe illness, and they were clearly disabled at 13 years. Uh, the 20% that had continuing illness, they have stayed um, quite ill and uh, done poorly. The reason I regret this study is that I've seen it quoted by a number of pediatric studies saying, oh, children with ME get better. And that's just not true, and that's the bad news of this study. Um, in the original 13-year study, half of the 80% had ongoing symptoms, but they were doing fine, meaning uh, that they would have a job, they got married, uh, they were leading normal lives. But when I ask them, uh, what happens if you stay at a party all night? Oh, that makes me feel sick for a couple of days. Or what happens uh, if you should try to exercise? Oh, I, I, you know, I can't exercise. I used to be able to, but... So that there were hints that even though they were doing very well, uh, there were still hints that there was some illness present. The other half of these had no hints uh, of that. And they were able to uh, exercise, uh, they were able to uh, do just about what in it, they were normal uh, to all intents and purposes. The reason I think that this is important is that the majority of uh, the children in this outbreak or this epidemic would never be diagnosed with ME because they tended to do fairly well within five years of the illness. And I was able to recognize it as ME or milder ME uh, because of the severe cases. And then I'd see a milder case and I'd say, you know, this is the same illness, but it's just milder. Uh, in the US, 80% of people with the illness are not diagnosed, and this is really the reason why. People that have milder illness, they, they're doing well, and they don't want to deal with this. They don't want to talk with their primary care about it because they're going to be referred to a psychiatrist because they're under too much stress. Um, <laughs> I really look forward to your cheery little visits. Uh, I'm nervous about this talk because uh, I consider it uh, bad news. The question is, how should recovery in ME be defined? Is it the absence of symptoms and return to normal levels of function, which means that whatever had been going on is now gone, or is it an adaptation to chronic symptoms and abnormal levels of activity? And that is, uh, I think, the more important definition, and we'll be coming to that. A secondary question is, if recovery is adaptation and not symptom resolution, does this coping lead to confusion and false perceptions of health? And this, I think, is going to become an increasingly important topic as the population uh, ages. Uh, maybe it's just that I'm aging and the population is staying the same, but this, uh, I believe, is, uh, I'm terming it health identity confusion. And um, I, I think that this is a major importance. It's one of the reasons why people with ME for a period of time, they don't go to the doctor anymore. Okay, factors which lead to health identity confusion, you all know these factors well. Normal appearance despite severe symptoms, public perception, medical perception, uh, consistently normal routine laboratory tests, specialty evaluations which are uh, not helpful, and the lack of evolution into cancer or multiple sclerosis. So people are told that they're really doing fine. You look wonderful today, you're doing fine. Uh, on the other hand, they don't feel fine, and this causes a confusion. This confusion is particularly damaging in young adolescents. If you take a 11, 12-year-old child and tell them that they are normal when they feel very ill, over a period of time, that becomes confusing. I'd be happy to give you uh, 25 different case history stories of how this evolves over time. Uh, we don't have time for that. The current study, we contacted the original pediatric uh, cluster, and we only were able to find 28 uh, who were willing to be part of the uh, study. 
Um, three had malignancies, uh, thyroid, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, and cervical cancer. Uh, and importantly, these were not the same exact individuals that was in the 13-year follow-up, and that's uh, important because we can't compare their uh, scores one-on-one. Uh, uh, -on -one. Now, the instruments we used, there were a total of seven instruments, and this is a, an excessive amount of instruments, but in my um, uh, approach, I wanted to look at each area of ME slightly differently. And uh, each researcher will have their own instruments that they become comfortable with in assessing follow-up. And I think that it's important that um, uh, at some point we uh, get uh, some communication so that the uh, follow-up instruments are uh, consistent across different studies. Okay, there were three groups that were distinguished by these studies. The first group is those who were entirely well, and that was uh, two out of the 25. Uh, the three with cancer were eliminated from the study. So the 8% um, were entirely well. If you looked at all of those uh, questionnaires, you couldn't distinguish them from healthy, normal people. And uh, this is down from the 20% in the 13-year uh, follow-up, so that it implies, although this were not the same in individuals, it implies that even some of those people who were entirely well are no longer entirely well. And that's, that's a, little fr a little frightening. The second group I'm calling remittent illnesses, or remitting illness. And they are people who consider themselves well, but their scores did not indicate that they were well. So um, they tended to fluctuate a great deal. They were doing reasonably well. Some were working, uh, and uh, some were uh, uh, fairly ill, but coping very well. But they considered themselves well. The third group, uh, is 20% and they had a very severe ME and they knew that they were sick and they were all disabled. And this is the same number as in the 13-year follow-up. Uh, no confusion in this third group. They were bedridden, they had come to terms with the fact that this was uh, a debilitating illness. Uh, they were all on disability of one form or another except very few of them had chronic fatigue syndrome as a diagnosis. Um, they got other diagnoses. Uh, and their, what would happen is their general practitioner would say, look, I know you're sick. Uh, I don't know what this is. We're going to call it um, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Oh, OK. And so that it, they were misdiagnosed, but they got their disability. And that's really uh, the thing that was important but um, they were not uh, given disability with the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. That's too difficult to do. Okay, the first, and what I think is the most important study is the SF36. The first question of the SF36 is, uh, how do you consider your health? And you have five uh, answers. You can say very good, good, fair, poor, very poor. So this is kind of a global question, and it's a really important question because it tells you how they perceive their health. All of the patients in that intermediate group, the remitting illness, they considered themselves either very good, good, or fair. Um, and the 20% who were disabled, they all knew that they were poor and they were poor. Their scores were very poor. We're not going to go into that um, in this uh, talk. These are the different subgroups of the um, SF36. And I find that uh, these subgroups very useful in creating a questionnaire fingerprint of this illness. Now, um, the healthy controls that I used were very healthy. I was careful to um, uh, ask them, have you ever had an illness where you were in bed for a year or more? And you'll be surprised at how many people uh, actually would say, well, you know, I did have mono for about three or four years. So that those patients I excluded from my healthy controls. Uh, in the uh, yellow uh, are my healthy controls, and in the, uh, I guess that's purple, uh, 
is the uh, normative data from the study. And this has been a very well-studied uh, questionnaire. So uh, basically the same, but they're all up there close to, uh, well, anywhere from 80 to 100. Now, this is Dedra Buchwald's uh, study of SF36 with uh, ME patients. And the yellow is the ME patients. Uh, and they were down at around uh, 25, 30, um, uh, except for the two mental health questions, which were up at around 50. Now, uh, one, uh, I'm, uh, I could uh, present uh, all 25 of these patients, but I won't. Uh, patient uh, BJ, um, uh, he said that uh, his health is good. He's, he's doing fantastic. But when you look at his scores, um, his general health perceptions, the second one, that's down in the ME range. Uh, his vitality, the third one, that's 40. That's very abnormal. Uh, and his um, uh, RP, his role physical, is down at 10, which is uh, very severe. So that um, there is a huge amount of scatter on this questionnaire. He thinks that he's very healthy, but when you look at what he does during the day, his coping allows him to participate in life to the degree that he can. And he is doing very well. Uh, this is the good news, is that he's having a wonderful life, I guess. Um, I, being a small town, you know fairly well, you know, whether or not people are lying to you or, or what. But, you know, he, he uh, works on a farm and he's, he's doing well. Yet his scores are not uh, healthy scores. Uh, the next patient is uh, GB, and um, she said that she, her health is fair. You know, she's not perfect, but fair. Um, but she still considers herself reasonably well. She's a uh, live-at-home mom, and uh, you look at her scores, they are terrible. They're worse than the normal ME patient. Uh, what has happened in 25 years is that she has learned how to cope so well that she can take care of her children while lying down, and she's getting along really well. She doesn't feel sorry for herself. Uh, she understands that physicians are all idiots and they just don't have anything to <laughs> contribute. And um, she's doing very well. And, you know, I look at her and I, I'm just amazed. I'm, I'm, I'm proud for her. I'm proud of her. Even though I had nothing to do with um, her coping, uh, she is doing well. She's got a very happy marriage. Her husband uh, has no problems with this. So that her scores are extremely severe, yet she is doing well. Many years ago, when I started uh, looking at uh, patients, I came across the Iceland study, and I heard uh, that there were two follow-up studies. One follow-up study said 90% of patients in the Iceland outbreak were doing great. They were uh, recovered. And the other study said, no, only 10 to 15% were recovered. And I couldn't understand it. How could they be so different? This is the reason why they're so different. If you run into this um, lady, she's a young lady now, 42. That's young for me. Uh, if you run into her in the supermarket, you say, oh, how are you doing? She said, oh, I'm, I'm doing great. You know, Johnny got an A on his uh, such and such a test. She's doing very well. When you actually dissect out her symptoms, she's not doing well at all. Uh, she has severe illness, and her illness has been steadily progressive over the past uh, 25 years. It's a biphasic illness. You're, let's say this is normal health. You get very ill. Within five years, you come up quite a, quite a bit. And she actually had come up to almost the point where she could consider herself normal. And then you seem to slide down. And this is the very bad news. I'm sorry for those of you who may have children with this illness, but this is far from a benign illness. And uh, I am very uh, worried about the long-term implications. This is another patient who considered himself very good, very healthy. And look at his scores. They're not very healthy. They're nowhere near the uh, normal healthy controls, which is a mishmash of the whole um, uh, healthy population. 
Um, when you look at the individual other studies, there are huge differences, and I won't go through all of these. Uh, this one is looking at specific symptom severity from zero to 10. Zero is none, 10 is um, very severe. Fatigue, uh, the controls, they have one at, at an average. So that, yeah, there are times that they have a little bit of uh, fatigue, usually after a long work day or something like that. The people with severe illness, uh, they're up in the sevens, and the remitting illnesses is just somewhere in between. In general, this is the pattern that you see in all of the different follow-up studies. So this is the uh, ability scale. So uh, controls were at 100. The persisting illness, the disabled, was down at 30. And the remitting was up at 85. Uh, the 85 is pretty good. And uh, this scale tends to be uh, weighted toward uh, orthostatic intolerance. So we'll come back to that. The pain questionnaire, again, um, a, a separation, uh, just like we were discussing. Uh, the sleep index, uh, again, same kind of separation. Uh, FISC fatigue impacts uh, questionnaire, the disabled was well over 100, and the remitting was down at 26, uh, and that's not too bad. Uh, now, the hours of upright activity is, uh, I think, the uh, most useful uh, question that a clinician can ask. And it's amazingly simple. The, the more complicated you make this question, the more impossible it is to answer. I ask people, how many hours total uh, are you up and around in a day? Add all the 15 minute segments, add you know whatever you have. And they will say, oh, I've done this on lots of healthy people, uh, and the average for healthy people is 15 hours. Uh, let's see, I got work, I'm away at work for this long, uh, this, I go bowling afterwards, uh, about 15 hours a day. So that if uh, a person with ME is asked this question, they'll say, well, I have 15 minutes here around breakfast, and I have uh, 30 minutes here, and I have this. So disabled people tend to be down from uh, at around five. Very severe illness is at around two. The bedridden patients are at around one to two. That's the most severe in general. Now, interestingly, that middle group, the remitting, is actually statistically within the normal range of normal. They're up at 13 hours a day in the remitting group. And that's the one category that they seem to be the most uh, close to healthy and recovered people. This brings me to, um, this is uh, the overall summary. We, let's not talk about that. But of those 72%, uh, they have mild to moderate illness, but they consider themselves pretty good. And that tells me that there is some health confusion, health identity confusion. Why is that? I think that the reason is that the people with ME, they remember the activity limitation of when they were so sick. Oh, I was in bed all day. You know, they wouldn't understand it. And now uh, that they seem to be doing better, they say, well, you know, now I can get out and do my shopping. I can do this. I, they have increased ability to be up and around. And I think that because of that, they consider themselves well. The problem with this is that they are not entirely well, and they get very confused. Um, and again, there are many stories about uh, uh, what happens when you have this health identity confusion. Something happens, uh, one lady had a seizure, and she wouldn't believe that her husband saw her have a seizure. Um, I don't think the seizure was connected with her ME, it might have been, but she refused to go on anti-seizure medicines because she couldn't deal with that. She, she was so confused about whether she was healthy or crazy uh, or sick, uh, she just didn't want to open that door uh, to look at it. And that confusion does have some, uh, some problems. So this is the hypothesis. Um, and going back to that original question, is it the absence of symptoms and return to normal levels of function? Only two of the 25 that occurred. Uh, in basically all the rest, they had tremendous adaptation. Uh, 
Uh, even those patients that were very disabled had adapted and were leading a pretty good life. Um, I'm amazed at how well my patients do uh, with their writing or with their poetry or with uh, one CEO was uh, uh, a, a lady who uh, was bedridden for a while. She started making teddy bears and gave them away at uh, Roswell Park Cancer Institute. She's happier now than she ever was when she was a CEO. And, you know, I believe that she's being honest with me. She has found herself and is comfortable with that. It's unfortunate she's sick, but she's come to terms with it. If recovery is adaptation, does this coping lead to confusion and false perceptions of health? Yes, it does. And um, my uh, advice to any pediatrician is you don't try to convince people they're healthy when they're not. You just say, well, I, okay, I, you have headache all day long. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, we'll, we'll try to treat that, but I'm not going to tell you if you just imagine yourself to be healthy, you will be much better off, because I don't think that that works. Uh, the psychiatrist says to his patients, I'd say they're about the most pathetic fantasies I've ever heard. <laughs> so uh, time will tell really what the long-term outcome of this illness is going to be, but I think that it's very important uh, for medical research to ex start defining recovery properly. You will see many studies um, where people will say, oh, I've cured 80% of my patients, and um, they will say that, they advertise that. Uh, in the 13-year follow-up of the children, I could say, that I cured 80% of my patients, but I didn't. I, I treated them as best as I could, but I don't think that any medicine I gave them was in that 80%. I think that that's just what the natural history of the illness. It's very important. Uh, it, let's say I was selling a particular vitamin. Uh, it would be immoral for me to say that I cured that 80% with my vitamin, um, I just don't think that that's what happens. So in terms of biomedical research, we need to be very careful about how we define recovery. I'm going to close there. This is my research group. <laughs> uh, that's, that's me in the center. Uh, thank you very much. Uh,